Hi, my name is Mary Beth Hallinan. and I am the music director here at the Peterborough Unitarian Universalist Church and I am honored to present three original songs this morning as prelude for Susan Ware's talk. Thanks for listening. If you want to reach out to me, you can find my email on the UU Church's website. All right, have a great morning.
Good morning. I'm Liz Tenterelli, President of the League of Women Voters of New Hampshire and your moderator for today. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum with today's guest speaker, Susan Ware. Before we get started, I'd like to thank today's musician, Mary Beth Hallinan, for recording that very timely music many of you enjoyed while waiting for the live broadcast to begin. Also, thank you to the New Hampshire Women's Foundation for generously sponsoring today's event. For many years, the Monadnock Summer Lyceum has brought outstanding world-class speakers to the Monadnock region to serve as catalysts to inform, engage, and inspire an active citizenry on local, national, and global issues. The Monadnock Summer Lyceum is supported primarily through contributions from our audience. We deeply appreciate your donations, which this year may be made on our website or by mailing your donation. During this challenging time, we need your help more than ever. Today's talk is being recorded and will soon be available as a podcast and as a video on our website, monadnocklyceum.org. The talk will also be rebroadcast on WSMN next Sunday at 11 and on WUML this coming Wednesday at 10. As is the tradition of the Lyceum, after the presentation, our speaker will answer questions from the audience. Please submit your questions by using the comments section on Facebook or YouTube and send them to our or send them to our email at monlyceum at gmail.com. So three options for you. After the broadcast, you may provide feedback on today's program, suggestions for next summer's speakers, or join our mailing list through our website. Our speaker today is Susan Ware. Susan Ware is a historian and biographer who is the author and editor of numerous books on 20th century United States history. Since 2012, Susan Ware has served as the general editor of the American National Biography, published by Oxford University Press. Susan has long been associated with the wonderful Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Particularly relevant to our talk today, Ware, ser Ware serves as the honorary women's suffrage centennial historian at Schlesinger Library. Our speaker lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in Hopkinton, New Hampshire, where I hear she has a mini version of Carrie Chapman Cat's suffrage forest with commemorative plaques that serve as the first item in her book, Why They Marched. While a student at Wellesley College, Susan attended her first feminist demonstrations on the 50th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. That would have been at the height of the push for the Equal Rights Amendment, which was finally ratified this past January. Susan Ware joins us today, 50 years later, still committed to the ideals of the suffragists and feminists and to making women's history accessible to the public. Professor Susan Ware. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Liz mentioned in her introduction, women's suffrage and I go way back. Uh, in fact, the centennial of the 19th Amendment has been on my radar for so long, it's hard to grasp that it's finally almost here. And I knew that this was going to be a big moment for women's history, but I hadn't fully anticipated how timely the topic of women and voting uh, and elections would be in terms of the upcoming 2020 election. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to be part of this larger conversation that I was sure the 19th Amendment uh, and its centennial would provoke. But here I faced a um, larger challenge than I anticipated how to make the fight for the vote come alive to modern readers. And from my perspective as a historian, the women's suffrage movement stands 
as one of the most significant and wide ranging moments of political mobilization in all of American history. Uh, among other outcomes, it produced the largest one time increase in voters ever. And as important as suffrage was, the goal was always much broader than just the franchise, speaking to fundamental questions about women's roles in politics and modern life and the relationship between citizenship and suffrage over time. And if we think of the suffragists as the voting rights activists of their day, we see how the suffrage movement fits into this larger story. And yet, I think too many Americans dismiss the 19th Amendment as a minor or inconsequential reform if they know anything about it at all. Uh, and I have to ask myself, why, why is this? Um, I don't think it's just inadequate coverage in textbooks or our general historical amnesia, uh, although those are clearly factors. Uh, too often, women's contributions to history, including the long struggle for the vote, have been marginalized or overlooked no doubt due to lingering sexism, if not outright misogyny. And among the other things um, the centennial of the 19th Amendment does is that it offers a chance to correct that misperception. Uh, the story uh, that I'm going to share with you today is a rich and complicated one, and it still speaks powerfully to us today. Now, the women's suffrage movement has always had a deep sense of its own history. Uh, and in many ways, suffragists were our first women's historians. Between 1881 and 1886, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Matilda Joslyn Gage produced the first three volumes of what they modestly called the history of woman suffrage. Uh, fourth volume came out in 1902, and then the fifth and sixth volumes in 1922, after the vote was finally won. And these volumes, which total more than 5,000 pages, were a combination of narrative history and something sort of like an archival dump, <laughs> you know, all the material they had, let's put it in the book. And the material that these books contained has fundamentally affected how the story of the suffrage movement has been told ever since. And while acknowledging a debt to suffragists' early efforts to preserve and document women's history, the story contained in the history of women's suffrage is at best an imperfect guide. Stanton and Anthony had an overt political agenda in compiling these volumes. Even though Susan Anthony didn't join the movement until 1950, they wanted to create a master narrative uh, that privileged the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 as the founding moment of a movement focused primarily on securing the ballot. They also wanted to cement their roles uh, as the main actors leading the movement and solidify their legacy at the expense of competing personalities who might challenge their dominance. And so in telling their side of the story, they consistently privileged gender over race, marginalizing the substantial contributions of African-American women to the broader struggle. And they also practically wrote the contributions of Lucy Stone's competing suffrage organization out of history. So we follow their lead at our peril. But luckily there is a broader, more inclusive history of the women's suffrage movement waiting to be told. And it does not start with Seneca Falls in 1848, nor does it end with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. It moves beyond the East Coast centric perspective of much of suffrage history to range widely in areas like the West and the Midwest where many of the early breakthroughs occurred. 
It even ventures beyond the borders of the continental United States, putting the suffrage movement in conversation with the global movement for women's rights. Another priority is to include the voices of a range of activists who were not just white and not just middle class. The most predominant, uh, the most prominent belong to African American women. And they are and their voices are joined by the voices of working class women and immigrant activists, all of whom shared a more intersectional vision of women's rights that included class and race alongside gender. And to my mind, the centennial of the 19th Amendment in 2020 demands a history that not only documents and engages the past, but also speaks to our own times. Now, historians often talk of something we call the long 19th century, uh, which is a period of nation building that stretched from the American Revolution in the 1770s to World War I. Um, we also often talk about the long civil rights movement, uh, which historians tend to start with Reconstruction and realize that that story is still ongoing. Uh, so I think suffrage historians thought when setting the chronological boundaries of the story of women's suffrage, why don't we declare a long 19th amendment? Um, and perhaps we should start in 1776 with one of the most famous quotations in all of American history. I'm sure you know what I mean, Abigail Adams's admonition to her husband, John, to remember the ladies. Or maybe we should start with the tantalizing fact that a few property owning women voted in New Jersey until 1807. But here's another candidate for where we should start the story. Uh, and it's a woman named Mariah Stewart. When Mariah T. Stewart, an African-American activist, spoke in Boston in 1832, she was the first woman, black or white, to speak in public about politics and women's rights before a mixed audience that included men and women of both races. Why isn't that moment just as celebrated as the Seneca Falls Convention 16 years later? Women's rights activism was always in conversation with other movements. It never operated in isolation. And I think that pushing the chronology back before 1848 recognizes those interconnections. And on the other end, the long 19th Amendment framing encourage us, encourages us not to see 1920 as a hard stop to the story. Uh, and there's several reasons for this. Uh, when chronicling women's activism in the post-suffrage era, historians agree uh, that there was no significant difference in the level or intensity of women's political engagement across the Great Divide, that is before and after 1920. It's not as if women got the vote in 1920 and went to bed and pulled the covers over their head and then didn't, didn't do anything. They got up the next morning and continued to be politically active. So there's a continuum there. But more importantly, the 1920 milestone had very little meaning for various groups of prospective female voters. Native American women, did not become fully eligible to vote until 1924. Puerto Rican women uh, only won the vote in 1935. And Chinese American women did not win the right to vote until 1943, uh, when restrictions uh, that had been put in place as far back as the 1880s on Chinese immigrants becoming citizens were finally removed as part of a wartime measure. But the biggest group excluded um, were African-American women, uh, most of whom still lived in the South. 
and they found that their right to vote was severely restricted by Jim Crow legislation alongside black men. And so for African Americans, as well as for Mexican Americans and other minority voters, it was the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and its amendments in 1970 and 1975, not the 19th Amendment that finally made the difference and truly gave them the right to vote. I think another priority is representing the women's suffrage movement in all of its regional diversity. And there are real practical reasons for this focus uh, since so many of the early victories occurred in Western states it's impossible to tell suffrage history without foregrounding that region. But it is more than just when certain states gave women the vote. We need to look at what was happening politically uh, in those states to understand the specific factors that led to success or defeat. Far removed from national headquarters, local politics were, no surprise, often messier and more complicated than the traditional top-down narratives let on. Oregon and Colorado and Utah are all Western states, but they all have very different suffrage stories. Uh, and the West is also where the stories of Native American women and Mexican American women primarily unfolded. It's also impossible to tell uh, the history of the women's suffrage movement without sustained attention to the South, a region which proved far less uh, hospitable to giving women the vote than the West because of its unwavering commitment to states' rights, as well as its allegiance to the potent uh, cultural ideal of the Southern lady. So toiling in hostile territory, Southern suffragists ran the gamut from outspoken racists like Belle Kearney to moderates like best-selling novelist Mary Johnston, who risked her literary reputation to write a suffrage-themed novel um, that tanked. <laughs> it did not do well. Um, but Southern women's suffrage was always deeply intertwined with a commitment to maintaining white su supremacy and that connection played out at both the state and national level, with national leaders willingly playing along with the racist arguments and practices of Southern suffragists and their male allies in order to keep them in the fold. And that meant giving them free reign to make the argument that Southern white women's voices could be used to outvote black men, and if, God forbid, they were also enfranchised black women, uh, and allowing Southern su suffragists to exclude African-American women from their organizations. So to fully tell the history of women's suffrage means putting race at the center of the story. And this cuts two ways. The first is the necessity to acknowledge the racism that plagued many of the leaders and no doubt their followers from the start and not just Southerners. Uh, this racism figures more prominently at certain chronological moments in the story, specifically the 1860s in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War and also in the 1890s, which is when the South is really clamping down with its Im imposition of Jim Crow segregation. Uh, and in a striking parallel to the racism of Southern suffragists, elite white Northern women um, pushed their, often pushed their case by doing something very similar, uh, which was by contrasting themselves with those that they felt were far less worthy of the vote. Uh, and in the case of the North, uh, they were usually referring to recent immigrants. And these statements, cringeworthy as they are to modern ears, need to be part of the historical record. But attention to race also leads in a different direction 
to a much fuller understanding and appreciation of the contributions of African-American women to the women's suffrage movement. African-American women brought something that was often lacking among white suffragists, an intersectional vision that refused to separate out gender from other factors such as race and class. And this in turn made voting rights part of a much larger conversation about social and political change for the African-American community at large. And this vision was there from the very start as witnessed by Mariah W. Stewart's pathbreaking 1932 lecture. Sojourner Truth, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Anna J. Cooper, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Mary Church Terrell, Terrell, Ida B. Wells, and so many others followed Stewart's courageous example all the way up to Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Constance Baker Motley, and the rest of the equally courageous women of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. Suffrage history looks quite different when African American women insist that their voices be heard in both freedom movements that affected their lives. Well, let's now turn to chronology. I used to tell my gra graduate students that chronology is your friend, and I often refer, re return to that um, because it provides a helpful background for understanding the specifics of the women's suffrage story. Um, so let's think of the history as divided into three stages, drawing on the energy and talent of three overlapping generations of women. The initial period covers everything up until 1865. Um, this first generation of original activists had deep roots in the abolition and anti-slavery movements starting in the 1830s and 40s. Women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Mariah Stewart, as well as Armenia White here in New Hampshire, were the first to speak out on women's issues in the antebellum period. Note that their vision was often much broader than just the vote, encompassing property rights, dress reform, temperance, abolition, education, and much more. Drawn together through overlapping networks, they gathered at conventions on a yearly basis from the late 1840s through the early 1860s, but didn't want to come together in a formal national organization. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, they shelved women's rights agitation for the duration. Profoundly influenced by the Civil War and its aftermath, the movement entered a second stage that ran until 1890. And in, in some ways, this period can be bounded on one end by the post-Civil War disputes that split the movement into the two competing groups, the National Women's Suffrage Association led by Stanton and Anthony and its rival American Women's Suffrage Association led by Lucy Stone. And on the other end, bounded by their eventual reuniting in the awkwardly phrased um, title of National American Women's Suffrage Association, sometimes referred to as NASA, uh, in 1890. But the story is more complex than just overcoming organizational rivalries. Um, while many women involved in suffrage continued to hold broad ideas about women's rights, in these years, the movement increasingly coalesced around the demand for the vote which is a more narrow goal. But the ballot raised its own minefield of issues after the Civil War, none more divisive than the unfortunate pitting of the rights of newly freed African-American men against those of white women in the debates over the 14th and 15th Amendments, which was the ostensible reason for the 1869 split. The ballot also raised complicated questions about the relationship between the states, which traditionally oversaw voting standards and procedures, and the federal government, 
offering two very different routes, state suffrage or a federal amendment as pathways to the shared goal of winning votes for women. And in the, but mainly in the 1870s and 80s, women's suffrage was a tiny movement which could point to few public successes. There were some early breakthroughs, mainly in Western states that enfranchised women when they entered the union. But in those years, being a suffragist was often a lonely and pretty discouraging proposition. The movement was still dominated by the same leaders who had come to prominence before the Civil War. Some of them, like Susan B. Anthony, would hold on to power into the 20th century. But a younger generation of leaders was emerging out of the states and localities, often in the Midwest and West. Women like Carrie Chapman Catt, a graduate of Iowa State University who had been a school superintendent, and Anna Howard Shaw, an ordained minister, directed their skills and talent to the suffrage cause. Things began to start percolating in the two decades on either side of 1900, and then exploded around 1909-1910 in what I often refer to as the quickening. Uh, the newly reunited suffrage movement proved increasingly strong and centralized leadership, national leadership, demonstrating how savvy they had become as political actors. The more women voted in Western states, the more politically feasible the vote seemed. And suffragists got on board with a range of new techniques in public relations and publicity, embracing open air meetings and campaign material like buttons and posters and public spectacles like suffrage parades, which began around 1910 and soon were ubiquitous. All of a sudden, the women's suffrage movement was impossible to ignore. So by the 1910s, a third generation of suffragists was rising, best typified by Alice Paul, a young Quaker woman who had participated in militant actions um, in England with the British suffragettes, including provoking arrest and then going on hunger strike um, when jailed. When she returned to the United States, uh, Paul was impatient with what she saw as the cautious approach of her elders like Shaw and Cat. And starting in 1913 with a dramatic suffrage parade in Washington, D.C., designed to coincide with Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, she began to build her own core following, which coalesced into the National Woman's Party. So once again, the suffrage movement was split into two rival groups, the older, more established NASA, which prefer, preferred a state-by-state -state approach, and the younger, brasher National Women's Party, which focused solely on passage of a federal amendment. NASA emphasized traditional forms of political persuasion like lobbying, while the National Women's Party embraced militant tactics such as picketing the White House, and suffragists were the first to, to do that. Rather than impeding the final victory, a strong argument can be made that these two competing approaches actually enhanced prospects for success. But for every suffragist agitating for the vote, there were many more Americans who were hostile or indifferent to the idea. Most of them were men, and of course, remember, men hold the power. They have the, they can vote. They they get to decide this. But their numbers included a uh, minority of women, and I think that the persistence of such broad-based opposition helps explain why it took nearly a century to win the vote. And so, for this reason, I think that it's really important for us to also talk about the ideology and tactics of the anti-suffrage movement as an important part of suffrage history. And at first, women's rights were seen as such an outrageous idea that opponents didn't even have to answer to offer a reasoned argument against the, uh, I, the idea. All cartoons and editorials had to do was lampoon women for stepping out of their sphere. But what had been outlandish in the 1840s 
was much more acceptable by the early 20th century. But still, there is a remarkable consistency to anti-suffrage ideology, which boils down to two main ideas. Women belong in the home, not at the polls, and they don't need the vote because they have men to protect their interests. And the power of the anti-suffrage arguments was rooted in the resilience of traditional gender roles. The ideology that women belong prim primarily in the domestic sphere, tending their homes and families under the watchful protection of their menfolk, was powerfully rooted in culture and society. And I think in retrospect, the heat of the debate was in part a reaction to how much had already changed in women's lives. And this realization in turn reinforced anti-suffragist fear of further change. It's like things have already gone too far. Let's not make it worse by giving women the vote. We also have to note that the suffrage movement faced powerful organized lobbies, uh, which aggressively pushed their point of view. Liquor interests were afraid women would vote for prohibition. Machine politicians feared women voters would turn them out of office. And manufacturers anticipated that newly enfranchised women would force passage of protective legislation and child labor laws, which would cut their profits. Conservative religious organizations like the Catholic Church were overwhelmingly hostile to larger political roles for women. Perhaps surprisingly, some of the most prominent and vocal antis were women, including a woman I write about in my book, um, Annie Nathan Meyer, who was actually a founder of Barnard College. I mean, go figure. <laughs> you wouldn't think that would have her be on the turn her into an anti suffragist if she was so supportive of higher education for women. But the fact that many women, especially middle class women, were not interested in their own enfranchisement was one of the most effective weapons that opponents had in their arsenal. So to com combat anti-suffrage opposition, as well as to chip away at general indifference, suffragists mounted a multi-pronged campaign dedicated to showing why women needed and deserved the vote. They alternated strategies and arguments depending on the situation and the context. An appeal to justice and fairness was one of the most popular. They said the vote was a basic right of citizenship and women should be treated on an equal basis with men. Suffragists also stressed what women would do with their votes, the so-called expediency argument. And while few suffragists ever made wildly grandiose claims that women would end war or clean up the cities, they did hope that women collectively might use their votes to address some of the urgent problems that were afflicting modern life. And working class women were especially insistent about needing the vote to improve their working conditions. So with all the arguments for and against suffrage on full display, what finally pushed the movement towards victory? And there's no easy answer to that question, but certain factors do stand out. The increasing number of women who were already voting in Western states made giving all women the vote seem more inevitable. Uh, and that in turn put anti-suffrage politicians on the defensive because they feared possible retribution at the polls if they didn't jump on the suffrage bandwagon. Uh, instead of voting as a block, there was a lot of evidence that women voted pretty much like men. So in a, in a different way, enfranchising women no longer seemed like such a radical idea. The give and take of partisan politics also played a role in setting up the final victory. The persistent lobbying in state houses and in the halls of Congress finally paid off with suffragists able to marshal a critical mass of support from male politicians who held the amendment's fate in their hands. Add to that women's patriotic contributions, 
on the home front during World War I, which strengthened their demand for the vote, and the militant actions of the National Women's Party, such as continuing to picket the White House even during wartime, put pressure on Woodrow Wilson and other elected officials to live up to the same democratic ideals at home that the United States said it was fighting for abroad. Even though the momentum seemed to be on the suffrage side, victory was never a given. The House of Representatives passed the 19th Amendment on January 10th, 1918, but the Senate didn't follow suit until June 4th, 1919, a year and a half later, with only two votes to spare. Then became, began the arduous process of winning ratification by 36 states, far more than the number of states where women currently voted. In the end, it took a tense, incredibly close vote in Tennessee to put the amendment over the top. And finally, on August 26, 1920, women's right to vote was enshrined in the US Constitution by the 19th Amendment. This was an important milestone, but still an incomplete victory as the cases of African American and Native American women show. Still, the amendment's passage certainly was cause for celebration as women prepared to go to the polls in the upcoming 1920 <clears throat> presidential election. The century long struggle to win the vote for women had ended, but not so the quest for women's equality. And 100 years later, that struggle continues. So why does suff women's suffrage matter? By the early 20th century, women had already moved far beyond the domestic sphere, yet a fundamental responsibility of citizenship was arbitrarily denied to half the population. The 19th Amendment changed that increasingly untenable situation, representing a major breakthrough for American women, as well as a major step forward for American democracy. Three generations of women honed their political skills in the women's suffrage movement, and those skills were put to good use after the vote was won. In their new roles as women citizens, women made a difference, which is another way of saying that women's history matters. And we have suffragists, our first women's historians, to thank for that. Stepping back, I see a direct line from the spectacles of the suffrage campaign to the sea of pink pussy hats worn at the women's marches held across the country, indeed around the world in January, 2017 to protest the inauguration of Donald Trump. And in many ways, the playbook that the suffragists pioneered right down to their distinctive colors of purple, gold, and white, and their seizure of symbolic public spaces provides a clear blueprint for the mobilization of women in our contemporary political landscape. Embrace a broad definition of political activism, which goes beyond electoral politics, but still encourages women to change the political system from within. Use popular culture and new forms of media to get the word out, but don't forget older techniques like lobbying and grassroots organizing. Deploy public spectacle and mass demonstrations to bring women and men into public spaces while simultaneously creating instant, instantly recognizable symbols and slogans to support their demands. Be intersectional. Mobilize coalitions and alliances that cross race, class, and other identities and draw on the energies of multiple overlapping generations. Most importantly, remember that feminism is a cumulative effort, not a one-off event, and it will always be necessary. All of these observations are just as relevant today as they were at the height of suffrage mobilization in the 1910s. Historian Anne Ferrer Scott, um, who I was lucky to know and, and to whom my book is dedicated, 
provided an especially evocative image of how winning the vote was part of larger changes in women's lives and in American society more broadly. And here's how she put it, quote, suffrage was a tributary flowing into the rich and turbulent river of American social development. That river is enriched by the rivers, by the waters of each tributary. But with the passage of time, it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish the special contributions of any one of the tributaries, end of quote. So think of, let's think of the contributions of individual suffragists, as well as the speeches, articles, cartoons, handbills, and flyers that they left behind as the tributaries that make up suffrage history. Each distinctive element flows into the larger stream, creating something stronger and more powerful than the individual voices. And then think of suffrage history as a powerful strand in the larger stream of US history, which is richer and stronger because it heeded Elizabeth Cady Stanton's prescient statement at Seneca Falls, channeling the Declaration of Independence that all men and women were created equal. The United States still lacks truly universal suffrage, but the 19th Amendment represented a giant step towards that goal. Whenever you exercise your right to vote, remember that you are standing on the shoulders of the suffragists. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Susan Ware, for that fascinating presentation about why they marched, celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage. Now we have time for some questions from the audience and we've gotten a few so far, um, but you may continue to submit questions on the Facebook and YouTube comments page or by sending an email to monlyceum at gmail.com. So let's start. And Susan, I'm fascinated that several questions came up about the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. It took 72 years from 18, 1848 until passage of the amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment was first proposed in 1923. Yep. Talk to us about the status of that and how that compares with the suffrage movement. Well, there is, there is certainly a direct link because Alice Paul, remember my militant picking the White House, picketing the White House, was the person who wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923. And she really saw it as the next step and was quite aware that even though there was now a constitutional amendment that protected the right to vote, there were so many other laws uh, where women did not have equal protection under the law. And to her mind, the best way to achieve that was not to chip away at state laws or do it through legal cases, but to try and marshal the force of, of the women's movement for yet another constitutional amendment. She didn't get as much traction uh, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s that she had hoped, but she never gave up the battle. And then in an interesting moment, again, of these generational conflicts between the young and the old, young feminists um, take up the Equal Rights Amendment uh, and, and, and also women who are involved in the National Organization for Women in the 1970s and make it a centerpiece of the revival of feminism. I think we know uh, how difficult it is to get a constitutional amendment passed. We saw that in the 70s uh, and with so many states that you have to do it and also the Anti-ERA had um, had a had an opponent, had a leader, uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who was just brilliant. And I always think it's probably just as well that there wasn't an anti-suffrage Phyllis Schlafly back in the 1910s, or maybe we wouldn't have gotten the vote. Um, it's back on the table now. Whether it passes, I don't know. Uh, but in some ways, as a symbolic statement. It would be, I think it would be important to have our constitution recognize equal rights for women in the same way that it 
recognized equal voting rights. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll be doing a show on that next summer. <laughs> so we do have the 38 states that have ratified it. That finally happened in January, but it was past the deadline that was part of the proposed constitutional amendment. And some states so, have rescinded. It's yeah. tricky. It's going to keep the lawyers busy for quite a while, but um, it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. And another parallel is that just as the suffragists worked state by state, getting women's suffrage in some individual states, Meanwhile, states have passed equal rights amendments of their own. So there are so many parallels going on here. Um, another question is about the bringing us up to date, I guess, um, that you, you make the point that this wasn't just uh, suffrage. It wasn't a movement alone. It was part of that larger struggle. Do you feel that women are still in the forefront of those struggles for social justice? the meaning of citizenship, human rights. Are we still in that forefront? And if not, how have women's roles as activists changed in the last century? Well, I would say anytime you turn on the television and see a protest march and see how many women are there, yes, we are there uh, and we still are. And often, especially in terms of protest politics, serving as a driving force but what we have to what what Americans have to be uh, careful about, and what women as well. When we say women, we have to recognize that that category is a very very broad one, and that it includes um, people with lots of you know from various different backgrounds and with different political ideologies. And so sometimes it's hard to generalize about the category of women. And yet I find myself, especially in this political moment we are in now so energized and excited about the attention that is being given to women as voters and women as candidates. How could it be more timely than having Kamala Harris chosen this week uh, as the vice presidential candidate on, on the Democratic ticket? Um, so I see a lot of energy out there and that, and I see it ongoing. Um, but I think that's the other thing I've learned from studying suffrage history so much is I just, I see it as part of a much larger story that is ongoing. And in some ways that's discouraging. I wonder, you know, what would suffragists think if they woke up now and they think, well, why aren't you further along? You know, <laughs> there's still so much to do, but there always will be more to do. Um, and I find, I find strength, personal strength, in seeing myself and whatever small activism I'm able to accomplish in my life as part of this larger tradition and continuum of women's political mobilization. And I don't see any evidence at all that that is slowing down. Uh, and in many ways, it, it may be intensifying. And somebody asked specifically, where would you place somebody like Stacey Abrams? in that continuum of activism? Well, she is the perfect example of where you go after you recognize the contributions that African-American women made to the suffrage movement and their communities as part of a larger recovery project about the incredibly important roles African-American women have always played in their communities, including now moving into state and national politics. Um, so she's, I see her as very much the next stage and way to go. Um, but she's also such an articulate spokesperson for something that we can't lose sight of, which is the fragility of voting rights. Um, her book, which talks about the attempts at voter suppression in Georgia and in other places, really shows that we cannot be complacent about the right to vote and that it is something that can be limited, uh, often deliberately. And I think her, her special role is by showing people that they really have to stay on top of this and to make sure that it, it doesn't happen and hopefully is reversed. I think you're so right about that. You know, as the League of Women Voters, we argue constantly 
for protecting those voting mm -hmm. rights. We have them on paper, now we have yeah. to protect them. And that includes uh, Native Americans in the mm -hmm. West, you know, where polling places are not accessible to them and, and all of those issues. So yeah. keeping up that work is important for men and women for equal rights all over. Um, but I've got a question that came in that says, are there still women who do, do not feel as if they are equal or deserve equal rights? And that makes reminds me of some of the anti-suffragists who said, women don't need this, we don't want it, leave us alone kind of thing. Are yeah. there still women who feel that way, do you think, about equal rights? Well, it's, it's hard for me to generalize, especially about a point of view that is never one that would have occurred to, I would have never articulated. But I, I do think there is, again, when we talk about these continuums or these long, long traditions, that you can draw a line between the kind of anti-suffrage arguments that really are grounding women more in the domestic, in their domestic roles uh, as wives and mothers and saying that they have all the rights they need um, is, is actually not all that different from what Phyllis Schlafly and the Stop ERA for Eagle Forum um, said in the 1970s. Um, so I think that there are still um, women who might feel that way. Uh, I would just say, well, all right, if you don't want to have those rights, just make sure you don't keep the rest of us from, from having them. Um, but, and also the other point I would make, and I think this is something that is becoming, we're becoming more aware of, that it's harder and harder to talk about things as just women's issues, because in many ways, women's issues are human issues. Uh, and if you think about you know, the Beijing conference in 1995, when Hillary Clinton says, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. There is a sense that these are all bound up together. Um, and that I think is where I certainly am putting a lot of my activism. And I think many others are as well, but not everybody agrees and they never will. So if we go back now a hundred years ago, just to, to when this all was finally happening, um, what do you think the influence of other countries was on the U.S., other countries that had granted women's suffrage earlier than the U.S. did? Did that impact the decision? Did World War I make the difference in the roles of women in the workforce in World War I? Um, that's a, that's a, a huge question. <laughs> it could be answered on many levels. You know, clearly, activists and politicians were aware that states like New or that countries like New Zealand had enfranchised their women much earlier. Did that make them want to catch up with New Zealand? I don't think so uh, at the time. I think one can see a clear impact of another country on this is the influence of the British suffragette movement and their radical tactics, which then influence the American movement, or at least one one wing of it, um, but I do think that it's it's. I one of the things I really learned when I was writing, doing the research for writing my book was seeing how American suffragists were much more in conversation with women's rights activists from around the globe. And this is not just at the very end, you know, not just in the 1910s, but back in the 1830s and 1840s. I mean. Elizabeth Cady Stanton goes to a anti-slavery convention in London on her honeymoon, and that's how she meets Lucretia Mott. And you see all these networks forming, crossing national lines um, that link the women together. And then you see that those connections continuing in the post, well, for us, the post-suffrage era after 1920. Um, so I think it is relevant to see the United States as part of a global movement where we are not the first, we're not the last, <laughs> we're, we're in the middle there, but very much in, in conversation with something that is being um, acted on throughout the country. And I do think that with the exception of maybe one or two small um, countries in the Middle East that women now do in, have the right to vote uh, across the world um, globally.
my mother was Swiss and mm -hmm. she always said, well, women didn't get the right to vote until the 1950s in Switzerland, to which I, as a little girl said, well, thank goodness I'm living here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still hard. It's still hard for me when I think about, you know, as a 20 year old going to the suffrage demonstration in 1970 that 50 years before women, not all women could vote. And that just doesn't register, it just doesn't connect. And sometimes when I talk to young women today and they say, you mean a hundred years ago, women couldn't vote? It's in some ways, it's a measure of its success that we take it for granted. But as I said earlier, we can't take it for granted. Um, but I do think it was such an important milestone because just trying to imagine a country that arbitrarily disfranchises half of its population. Um, that's, that's not a democracy. It's, it's not. And I think Alice Paul's in your face signs in front of the White House that uh, President Wilson, how, how long must we wait for democracy? That was one of the tamer ones. <laughs> yes, it was. And we won't talk about Kaiser Wilson right now. Uh, so, you know, we had all those tactics. We had lobbying in Congress, obviously, and we had the demonstrations and we had Alice Paul's in your face tactics and it took it all. And it probably will take that combination of factors to do the next steps to really get um, wonderful, full participation of everybody, not only in the voting process, but in equal rights. And we're running out of time, Susan, so I thank you again for sharing your time, your expertise, and your stories with us. Susan Ware's books are available through the Toadstool Bookstore in Peterborough, and books will be delivered or mailed, so give them a call. Now, our program next Sunday will feature Barbara Bramble, who will discuss on fire from the Amazon to Australia. We hope you have enjoyed today's live broadcast of the Monadnock Summer Lyceum. Thank you for your support of this unique 2020 season. And we hope you'll join us again uh, next week for another talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.